Okay. Um, so we were talking about some uh, basics on heat exchanger design. And I asked you also to read the chapter 12 and I sent you last Friday also some rules of thumb to review um, when uh, designing heat exchangers. And we were talking about how to assign the fluid routing or how to select which fluid is going to be going to go in the shell and which fluid is going to go through the tube. Um, also, we said that typically we uh, create um, temperature diagrams that are nothing more than length versus the temperature in the heat exchanger. And today we are going to go through one of those thermal diagrams to solve a heat exchanger with phase change. Um, if you see uh, here, we start from the cold end to the hot end, right? And what we want to avoid in these thermal diagrams a temperature cross, right? Because that will occur when the outer temperature of the cold fluid is higher than that of the warm fluid. So that means we are doing something really wrong uh, because this will pose a temperature driving force problem, right? So all, all of the rest are correct and this is how a cross would look like. Um, when we deal with heat exchangers with phase change, and this is a problem that we are going to solve today during the lab, uh, the best idea is to divide in stones the problem, okay? So we divide in pieces the problem, and then we solve some, some one, then we solve some two, then we'll solve some three, or as many stones as you can have, and we add the area, for example, if we want to know the entire area or the total area for that heat exchanger that is experiencing phase change. So stones can be best defined as regimes of phase changes where the overall heat transfer coefficient and mean temperature um, difference that is the driving force will vary, like you can see in this simple diagram. Okay, and again, the strategy to solve this kind of heat exchangers that undergo phase change is to solve zone by zone. And here I'm dividing um, the three zones that you see in here in this first big uh, picture, right, uh, as first zone one. And in zone one, we have, for example, our, again, thermal diagram. And we have chemical one entering the shell at 200 Celsius as a superheated vapor. In zone one, it released heat to the tube side, chemical in, in chemical number two. And zone one ends just as the chemical one begins to condense. Uh, the tube side chemical number two enters as a liquid or gas and does not change phase through the heat exchanger. The chemical one leaves the zone one and enters zone two as its boiling temperature. And T star marks the temperature of the chemical two when the chemical one begins to condensate. And don't worry, we will solve a problem. So you will see with a problem, it's much easier to see the zone. Then we can have zone two in the, that I took from the first, big picture of the first diagram. And in zone two, the chemical one condenses to completion while chemical two continues to increase in temperature. The temperature of chemical two and when, when chemical one is fully condensed is denoted by T star star star. Finally, in zone three, both chemicals are liquid. Chemical number one is simply liberating heat to chemical two as it becomes a sub cold liquid and exits the shell at 100 Celsius. So as you can see, once we establish our zones and our thermal diagrams, we will solve like a regular heat exchanger, but in pieces, because here we have delta T1 and delta T2, right? We can get the logarithm temperature there, right? And we can get properties for those uh, fluids at those conditions in zone two, and then put everything together, okay? And again, we are solving a problem today, so you can see how it's done. Once we have a, temper a, ter a thermal diagram, we can get the number of shells in series from the thermal diagram. And this is a very old uh, graphical method, okay? It's not really accurate, but it gives you a good tentative idea of uh, what number of shells to propose in the beginning, okay? So how this is done? So first of all, you establish the inlet temperature, outlet temperature, right? For the tube side and for the shell side. And you can draw these kind of two lines, right? In, out, in, out. So we start from the cold approach here in this area, right? And we start drawing stairs or lines that cross to 
the, the tube side, shell side, tube side, shell side, tube side, shell side, and as many steps as you accommodate in this thermal diagram, that will give you an approximate of the number of shells that you can start with, okay? Again, this is a very simple and old method, graphical method, and, um, but again, it can give you a good start to select the shell size, the number of shells. The next step in our design, and we are going to go through a design of a heat exchanger during class time, is uh, to calculate the mean temperature difference, the log mean temperature difference. And you know how to do this, right? And um, so uh, the difference of temperatures between shell and tube inlet and outlet, and we apply a correction factor. Why? Because it's a shell and tube. We are learning to design shell and tube heat exchanger. So for sure, we need to include a correction factor. And you know we have tables for determining those correction factors, right? Uh, and well, LMTD only applies when there is no phase change or when the phase change involves a pure liquid X. Uh, the correction factor, you know, you have tables in your book, you have tables in chapter 12 for design of heat exchangers that I share with you. And the correction factor accounts for the complex flow pattern of one shell uh, pass, tube, tube pass, the shell, and tube heat exchanger, uh, or for any number of pass and any number of, sh of shells. It accounts for the complex flow pattern in this type of heat exchangers. Um, and um, these are common numbers, but the best idea is to always read the correction factors from your graph. Uh, the next step, and it's something that you need to do in your project, and also we are going to do here in class, is to select the tube diameter, the thickness, the length, and the configuration. And that heavily depends on the fluids you are using, right? Also, because you need to be very careful with the materials you select. So here are some common sizes and some common lengths and some common thickness. Um, but again, uh, the, the wall thickness is going to be determined by working pressure and corrosion allowance. And we will see that. Um, here are uh, some tables of common tube dimensions. And this is just a part of a table. Uh, but again, in chapter 12, I share with you, there's long tables, including common types of uh, tubes for heat exchangers. Uh, here, I'm just summarizing common dimensions. Uh, for tube diameter, pitch, and configuration. Okay, so depending if you select triangular, square, rotated triangular, or rotated square. Um, the next step would be to calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient, and I think it's something we practice already a lot with our LMTD method, uh, right? So it's the sum of the whole resistances, right? Then we can calculate the ADM. And these are the formulas we have been working since we start with um, the electrical analogy for the overall heat transfer coefficient, the convective plus the conductive plus the second convective, right? Important, sometimes we need to add to this overall heat transfer coefficients what? Full in effect, right? And um, this is because we the use we give to our heat exchangers. And essentially here I'm showing some pictures of different fuelings, okay, that you can face like a scaling fueling, freezing fueling that is um, common to happen in paraffins and hydrocarbon services, chemical reaction fueling, particulate fueling, and biofueling. Typically uh, we remove, or there are three popular methods to remove fueling. Uh, so mechanical cleaning, brush and scraping, chemical cleaning, solvent or chemical reaction, and high velocity water jets. Uh, fulling resistance uh, values, we have values here and uh, for different type of fluids. And again, you have a longer table in your chapter 12. So you can get fulling factors from there. And when you select fulling factors from tables, what, what is the number that we typically use, the smaller or the bigger one? The bigger one, right? We over design all the time. So this is how it looks, um, full surface and after cleaning. So, and this is how it's performed the cleaning of with water jets, as you can see here on the top images, right? So as you can see, there's a huge difference 
uh, between a full surface and a clean surface, and that obviously is going to impact the area of heat transfer and also the heat transfer rate or the heat transfer duty. Um, overall, typical heat transfer coefficients in heat exchangers. This is a short table. Again, in your textbook, in your textbook, in the chapter 12, I share with you. You have tables that are two, three pages long. So this is just to give you an idea that you have available these values of overall heat transfer coefficient that can help you to start a design. So this is the same thing, the, the same table. Next step would be to estimate the store phase area requirement. So typically, once we have the overall heat transfer coefficient, we can get the area. Finally, we can estimate the shell dimension, then the tube side pressure drop, and then the shell side pressure drop. These are very important. Why? Because the delta P allowance depends on the pumping cost, available head driving force, operating pressure of equipment fit in the heat exchanger. Pressure drop allowance is part of the design specification and is very important because as you will see in the problem that we are going to evaluate, if we don't accomplish the, the delta P that someone is asking us to design for, we need to recalculate several parameters until we, uh, we provide the allowed pressure drop. The, the tube side pressure drop results from friction losses through the tube, turbulence losses in re reversing direction, and contraction and expansion losses on entering and exiting the tube. Um, the shell side pressure drop, as I already mentioned, is as important as the tube, shell, tube side pressure drop. And typically, someone, so when someone asks you to design a heat exchanger, they are going to give you the allowed pressure drop for the tubes and the allowed pressure drop for the shells. And you, you need to accomplish both, okay? Um, so the shell side pressure drop depends on the number of tubes the fluid passes through in the bundle uh, between the baffles as well as the length of each crossing. And... Um, I already mentioned this in previous slides, how to increase the heat transfer coefficient, uh, decrease the baffle space or decrease the baffle cut, and this is for the shell size, obviously, but some factors also can increase the pressure drop. So there's a compromise, there's a trade-off there, and uh, that's something you need to be aware of. So I'm going to start with a problem with a phase change heat exchanger. So you can see how to divide in zones and how to solve when you have phase change in heat exchangers. Because up to now, I'll just give you the picture, right? That you have zones, you divide in zones, and you, you solve by zones. But I need to show you how this is done. So let's uh, evaluate then this problem of a heat exchanger with phase change undergoing. So we have 22 kilograms of cyclexine and is fit to a heat exchanger tube side as a liquid at 40 Celsius and 150 kilopascals. The cyclexane exists, exits the heat exchanger as a saturated vapor at 150 kilopascals and 94 Celsius. You might assume negligible pressure drop across the heat exchanger. Low pressure steam enters the shell side as a saturated vapor at 165 Celsius and 232 kilopascals, and exits as a saturated liquid at 165 Celsius and 232 kilopascals. Using a zone analysis hand calculation, first estimate the total area required for these heat exchangers in meter squares. Show all your calculations and sketch your shell side and tube side temperature profiles. And we have given a lot of properties. We have physical properties for the cyclexane and for the water steam. Uh, we have the CP liquid, CP vapor, and the enthalpy of vaporization for both streams. Okay. Uh, we have given also individual heat transfer coefficients, which will simplify our problem, right? Because otherwise, we need to use our nozzle correlations from force convection to get our heat transfer coefficient, right? So this uh, seems that we already have this data, the individual heat transfer coefficient. And it says you might assume wall and fulling resistances are negligible in using this to estimate the overall heat transfer coefficient. So we are not including fulling, we are just using this one, right? Is what it's saying. So we have heating cooling liquid, boiling condensing, heating cooling vapor, 
And um, we have also the same for water and steam, right? In the shell side, because the water and the steam goes through the shell side, right? That's why we name it H node. And the cyclexine is going through the tube side. That's why we name it HI, right? In and out. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> very important boiling and condensing um, uh, heat transfer coefficients are much higher, right? And we already say about that. You compare the numbers here, and they're always much, much higher, right? When there's phase change. Um, the second question would be, assume that in the sensible heating of cyclohexane liquid zone, the velocity inside each individual 3,4 BWG 14 tube is two meters per second. Use an appropriate correlation to calculate the H value, HI value uh, for this zone and compare with the value given in the table above. So we need to use a nozzle correlation to get the HI and compare with this value given in the table. Okay, that's the second question. So main objectives of this problem that I want that you learn. First, I want that you determine if and what phase changes are occurring within the heat exchanger. And that's very important, okay? Then I want that you set up and design according to heat transfer zones, recognizing that the energy balance and heat transfer coefficients differ for sensible versus latent heat, okay? And let's recall then the terms. What is sensible heat? Is the energy required to change the temperature of a substance with no phase change. Latent heat is the energy absorbed or released from a substance during a phase change from a gas to a liquid or solid or vice versa, right? So then that's why it's very important that you recognize that the energy balance and heat transfer coefficients differ for both cases, sensible and latent, okay? First step, I'm going to identify my zones, right? So how I identify my zones? Well, drawing a thermal diagram or the temperature profile, okay? So I'm just going to make a diagram or a plot of length of the heat exchangers, right? Versus the temperature. And for the shell side, what is happening in the shell side, guys? We have low pressure steam enters a saturated vapor at 165 Celsius and 232 kilopascals and exits a saturated liquid at 165 Celsius and 232 kilopascals. So what is the entering temperature? 165. What is the exit temperature? 165. So that is the shell, right? Let's move to the tube. So in the tube side, what we have? We have cyclexine is fed as a liquid at 40 Celsius, right? At 150 kilopascals. And then cyclexine exits the heat exchanger as saturated vapor, vapor, we have a phase change there, right? At 150 kilopascal and 94, um, 94 Celsius. So it enters, right, as a liquid here at 40 right? But then it reaches 94, right? And then it exits as a vapor in the shell sites at 94. Okay, so that will divide our two zones, right? Zone one here from 40 to 94 when we change from liquid to vapor, uh-huh, and then the zone two, right, that it will lead us to the exit, right? So uh, we need to know the size of this heat exchanger, right? And you know that to size a heat exchanger, one of the main quantities or intermediate amounts we need to calculate is the overall heat transfer coefficient, right? Because heat transfer rate in zone one equals overall heat transfer coefficient in zone one times the area in zone one times delta T logarithm in zone one, right? Where areas in zone two the heat transfer rate equals mass flow rate times the L delta H of vaporization. That's why I, I make very clear here that the heat transfer coefficients and the energy balance differ for sensible and latent heat, right? That's one of the things that you need to uh, recognize. So let's analyze the zone number one. When sensible heating of cyclic stain liquid happens from 40 to 94 Celsius. So we apply our energy balance, mass flow rate times CP times delta T, right? 
Mass flow rate, how much cyclohexane we're feeding? 220 kilograms per minute, okay? But I'm going to change it to seconds. So at the end, I can change to watts, right? Because a joules divided by seconds is a watt. So I multiply or I divide by 60, right? So I can cancel these minutes. Um, then I go to the tables uh, for properties that were given in this problem. And I read the CP for cyclic same liquid, right? And the delta T, 94 minus 40. That gives me a heat transfer rate of 396 kilojoules per second, or 396K watts, right? What would be the next step in order to get the area out of our Newton's cool similar equation? We are missing the overall heat transfer coefficient and the log mean temperature difference. We just get the heat transfer rate or the duty, right? So let's get the overall heat transfer coefficient. And the problem says disregard fooling, right? And we are not counting also the, the conductive ones because they are very thin tubes, right? So we just have the two convective. So we have the cyclohexane tube side heating, cooling liquid, the water steam shell side boiling, condensa condensating. So one over 150 plus one over 6K, and the inverse of that give us 146.34 as overall heat transfer coefficient. What we are missing, the log mean temperature difference, okay? Uh, so we have to do delta T1 minus delta T2 divided by natural log of delta T1 divided by delta T2, okay? Uh, so I just do the difference of temperatures, right? And I get delta T of 95.5. So I'm ready to put this in the area. Okay, um, in this equation to get the area, so heat transfer rate divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient and by delta T. That gives me 98.3 meters square for zone one. But that is not the, the entire area, right? We need to add the area for zone two. Good, so let's do it. Let's evaluate zone two where uh, we have the cyclohexane vaporization occurring. So as I already mentioned, the heat transfer rate um, calculations differs a little bit, right? It's going to be mass flow rate times delta H of vaporization. Again, we are feeding 220 kilograms per minute, right? I divide by 60, so I can get rid of the minutes and have everything in watts at the end and the delta H of vaporization, cyclohexane delta V of vaporization that we read from the tables above. This, this gives me um, 1269 kilojoules per second. Again, we repeat the same thing. I need to get the overall heat transfer coefficient, right? Disregard fooling and disregard conduction. Why? Because they, they, they are very thin, right? So it won't impose a great uh, resistance. So one over cyclic sand tube side boiling condensing and plus one over water steam shell side boiling condensing. I have an overall heat transfer coefficient of 783 watt meter square Celsius. The delta T difference is going to be only 165 minus 94, right? Because if you check the diagram, it becomes clear, right? We are in this zone. 165, delta T1, 165 minus 94. That's the only difference in temperature we are experiencing in zone two, okay? So see how the calculations are different when you are dealing with phase change, right? That's why you need to divide in zones. So delta T, 165 minus 94, 71. Then again, I will take area out of, out of the equation, right? Heat transfer rate divided by overall heat transfer coefficient times delta T gives me an area of 22 for zone two. How is going to how much is going to be the total area? Zone one area plus zone two area, right? So I got in zone one 28 plus 22 in zone two. So the total area for this heat exchanger is 51.2 meters square. 
main thing I need that you realize that the calculations are somehow different, right? From what we have seen so far. And the first step as always is to recognize you have two areas and divide in the respective areas. Um, the next uh, problem, the next question was to calculate um, HI um, with one of our nozzle correlations and compare it with the one from the table. So this is nothing more than a convective flow inside a pipe, right? Um, and the problem gave us a velocity of two meters per second. And I'm going to read properties at the average temperature of 40 plus 94. Uh, so here are all the properties, K, density, um, absolute viscosity, and the brand. And I'm going to use this equation for the smooth pipes that I'm pretty sure you are very familiar with it. That is the 0 0.023.8 brand to the one third, uh, because it's valid for a wide number of plants and Reynolds bigger than, than 10,000. Um, we need to read um, the inner diameter for a 3-4 inch BWG 14 tube, and that diameter is 0 0.01483 meters. So I'm going to put everything in the equation. So I'm just putting here the definition of the nozzles, but I'm sure you are very familiar with it, is H, HD times K, right? And times 0 0.03, and I'm going to put the Reynolds here. So this is the Reynolds equation, right? I'm just putting it all there. And the Reynolds give me around this number to the 0.8 times the prank to the one third. And the prank comes from tables. Convective heat transfer coefficient is much higher, as you can see, than the given value of 150 watt meter square Celsius. Um, this might be due because many reasons, and one of the reasons I can give you is that the given value might include significant pooling resistances already. The other possibility for having these disparity numbers. I assume a smooth pipe, right, and a very simplified nozzle correlation. Uh, there are some other nozzle correlations that even include friction factors or uh, can give us uh, more exact uh, values of the convective heat transfer coefficient or the nozzles. So maybe we need to keep trying and look if there's some other um, that can give us a similar value than the one given in in the table. Okay. <clears throat> No, so I want that you open your file for chapter 12, please, the heat transfer equipment. And we are going to go through the problem 12.3. Uh, what you are going to do in your heat exchanger project in, in terms of hand calculations. So page 683, please. <clears throat> Example 12.3. So we are going to go through this and I'm going to um, project in the PowerPoint also the plot and how to read the plot so you can double check how to do that. So let's read the problem. Uh, we need to design a shell and tube heat exchanger for the following duty. Uh, 20k kilograms hour of kerosene, 42 AP, leave the base of a kerosene side tripping column at 200 and it's to be cooled to 90 by exchange with 70k 70k kilograms per hour liquid crude oil 34 api coming from a storage at 40 celsius the kerosene enters the heat exchanger at a pressure of five bars and the crude oil at 6.5 bar a pressure drop of 0.8 bar is permissible on both streams. So this is your limitation. That's your pressure uh, drop permissible in both streams, 0.8 bar. Allowance should be made for fooling by including fooling factors of 0 0.0003 on the crude stream and 0 0.0002 on the kerosene stream. So let's uh, let's start with the calculation. So First of all, the specification is given in the problem statement, right? We have the mass flow rate, um, 20K kilograms per hour of kerosene at 200 Celsius is going to be cooled to 90 
by exchange with 70k kilograms of light grid oil at 40, 40 Celsius. The kerosene pressure 5 bar, the crude oil pressure 6.5 bar, permissible pressure drop 0.8 in both streams. Fulling factors are given. Uh, however, uh, in order to complete the specification, the duty or the heat transfer rate and the outlet temperature of the crude oil must be calculated. And this is a strategy that we apply too much in, your, uh, in our LMTD method, right? To use the energy balance of one of the streams that we know to get the missing temperature. So it's exactly what we are going to do right now here uh, in this problem, guys. So uh, the mean temperature of the kerosene is 145 Celsius. And at this temperature, the specific heat of 45 AP kerosene is 2.47 kilojoules per kilogram Celsius. So let's start calculating the duty. The duty, and we are going to use the kerosene data is 20K kilograms per hour. And we are going to divide by 3,600 3, 3, 3, seconds to change or eliminate the hours. That's why we are dividing here, okay? It's just um, units. Uh, times the CP, right? The CP is given here for the kerosene, the 2.47, times the delta T, 200 minus 90. So this is just an energy balance, guys. Mass flow rate, right, times CP, times delta T. We are just dividing by 3,600 3, to eliminate the hours and half in seconds. So we have joules per second or kilojoules per second. That means kilowatts, right? So we have a value for the kerosene stream of 15 uh, 09.4 kilowatts. Why we did with this with the kerosene and not with the the oil stream? Yeah, because we have all the temperatures, the two temperatures for that stream. We have the most data available for that stream. So as we do, as we did in our LMTD method, is the same strategy. Take the stream that we know more and get the missing data out of it. So the next page in this chapter summarizes pretty nicely for you the step-by-step -step of how to design a heat exchanger. And it's what we are going to do through this problem, okay? So if you follow, again, this algorithm in page 684, you should be able to, um, to come up with a decent heat exchanger design, okay, shell and tube. So, Let's, let's then get the missing temperature because it's what we are trying to do, right? The missing temperature. So as first trial, as first trial, we are going to take the mean temperature of the crude oil as equal to the inlet temperature, that is 40. And the specific heat at this temperature is 2.01 kilojoules per kilogram Celsius, sorry. We do an energy balance again, right? And there's a typo here, this is 70K. Okay, because that's the mass flow rate given. So this is a typo here. Again, the value given is 70K, okay? So 70K divided by 3,600, again, to eliminate the hours and half in seconds, right? Times the CP given, or that you can read from tables, right? Times delta T. And be careful, we are assuming that the crude oil the, the mean temperature of the crude oil is equal to the inlet temperature of 40. So the inlet is 40. And T2 is something that we don't know, right? That's the missing temperature. But we know the duty or the heat transfer rate from the kerosene, right? And is this, that's this number, guys, okay? So get T2 out of there and double check you are getting 78.6. So this is nothing more than MCP delta T, right? For the, for the oil current. <clears throat> so now we read the specific heat at this temperature, the new temperature we calculate, right? 59. And we do a second trial calculation to give us the value of 77.9 and a new mean, free temper mean temperature of 58. So let's do the calculation. How good look this calculation? It would be 70K divided by 3600 to eliminate the seconds times the new CP 
here, 2.005 times T2 minus 40, right? And you get T2 out of there again. So there's no, specific, no significant change in the specific heat at this mean temperature from the value used. So take the crude stream outlet temperature to be around 78, right? That is the value that you got for T2 with these new calculations, right? Well, I got 77.86, but around 78, right? No, it's similar to what we did with LMTD, right? We are just trying to get a more precise value by iterating. Um, step two, go to tables and get your physical properties, okay? You get physical properties at three temperatures. You get physical properties at the inlet temperature, at the outlet temperature, and at the mean temperature of the inlet and outlet, okay? And we are going to use all the time the mean. But uh, the book here is specifying the three columns, okay? Inlet, outlet, and mean. Mean, obviously 200 plus 90 divided by 2, 45. So you read all the properties for the two current in the tube and shell at the mean temperature, inlet and outlet. But again, we are using the mean for calculations. The book is showing the two extremes. So we need a specific heat, thermal conductivity, density, viscosity. And same thing for the second current. Step three, get the overall heat transfer coefficient. So in this type of heat exchanger design, what is typically done is that we go to figure or table to get a value to start our design, right? So let's go to table 12.1 or figure 12.1 and um, I should have them here guys so this is your uh, your uh, table this is your table 12.3 so look for tables the same um, 12.3 sorry <clears throat> and we have kerosene and light crude oil so Based on the viscosities and densities that you can read in the properties, uh, we can treat them as both being light oils, okay? Um, that is something that you need to decide. And at the end of the design, you have to do a correction with the viscosities to double check this assumption is correct, okay? Uh, so I'm going to start assuming that I'm going to treat both of them as light oils. And as you can see, the overall heat transfer coefficient is between 100, 100 and 400. And again, this is a decision that comes directly up on you guys. You can choose 100, you can choose 400, you can choose 300. That's up to you and that's your design. So that's why each team will come up with different design because there's no team that is going to choose the same as another team, right? So, that's up to you guys. You have a range from 100 to 400. And again, if you go to figure 12.1, you are in the oils area. So this oil area is here, right? Before, before 500. So you can say 400, you can say 350, right? So that's your oil area. So whenever you choose your design and whenever you are going to work on your project, I need that you tell me exactly which table, which figure you use and which value you, you use also. I use an average, I use an upper value, I use a lower value, why? So the book says we are going to start with 300 because it's in between 100 and 400, okay? So this is the value that uh, the book is proposing. <clears throat> Step four, exchanger type and dimensions. So an even number of uh, tube passes is usually prefer, the preferred arrangement. At this position, the inlet and outlet nozzles at the same end of the heat exchanger, which simplifies the pipe work. So, the, the book is already give you, giving you some guidance, right? 
And if you need more guidance, you need to read that part in the chapter about um, how to select number of two passes. So since we, are, since we have to start with an even number because it's practically much easier in terms of building the heat exchanger, let's start with one shell pass and two two passes. So with that, this will enable us to calculate the correction factor, right? So let's start with the delta T log. And you know this, right? So the difference of temperatures of the, of the two currents, right? But we need to get the correction factor from figure 1219. And if not, you have tables in your book, the tables that we check for LMPD. So it's the same tables, okay? So to read those tables, I'm going to calculate R and S, right? That I think in your book, they are named R and Z or something like that, yeah. They are kind of different there. And um, let's go there then, here. That's table 1219 in your hands out, in the ones I, sh I share with you. Uh, we said one shall pass two or more even two passes. So this is the one, right? Because remember you have several, several graphs. You need to be careful that you choose the right one. We calculate a value or the value of S is calculated there, right? And also the value of R. The value of S is 0.24. The value of R is 2.9. Then we find ourselves around here. We go all the way to the left side and we have a value of 0.88 or 0.887, yeah, right below 0.9. We get the correction factor, what's the next step? the delta T logarithm temperature times the correction factor that give us the corrected log mean temperature difference for a shell and tube. That is 70, 71 Celsius. 